Enceladus. Enceladus? Could be Enceladus. Enceladus. We will continue to get light from Proxima Centauri, the closest star to us. Proxima. As it turns out, I was actually thinking of doing an Iron Lung Theory video on my channel, but I've been too busy playing what is basically Power Watch Simulator in space to get to it. So I was beat to the punch by none other than Austin. Wait, Austin? All right, Matt Pat's had to stop doing science videos to do lore videos now as the channel's gotten larger. Oh well, at least Austin still does. Mispronunciation aside, Austin did get a lot right in his video. The Jovian system, which if you're not familiar with is the term for Jupiter and its moons, is a pretty good place for humanity to go if the Earth and Sun were to suddenly disappear like they do in the story of Iron Lung. But I feel he overlooks the possibilities around Saturn, and he also uses a really bad example of a star to represent the amount of distant starlight we would receive from then on. So let's jump into the video. First, we need to do a quick recap of what Iron Lung is for the unfamiliar. No, no, not that Iron Lung. This Iron Lung. Iron Lung is a new little indie horror game. No, no, none of that. Actual horror, real horror, Lovecraftian horror, deep atmospheric dread that leaves you anxious. It's been popping off on YouTube as of late, and for good reason. We've been short on these really good horror titles lately. We've had a lot more of these horror for kids that people are starting to get sick of at this point, and Iron Lung really turns that around. It's made by the developer of Dusk, a retro-themed shooter that's a throwback to the 90s that's actually a hell of a lot of fun. So he has a good track record. Iron Lung takes place in a future at an unspecified date. The intro does at least tell us that humans have spread out over multiple star systems by this point. This would indicate that we have space stations and starships, certainly, as it says that they survived. We know we're interstellar as a species, at least, because if we were still only in our solar system, it wouldn't particularly matter if any of the other stars disappeared. At least not for a long time. The developer could have just said that the sun disappeared, and that would have been enough. It also implies that we had discovered at least one other habitable planet out there. And while we have a few prospects, we don't actually have confirmation that anything out there has Earth-like conditions. Also, the developer could have named the moon in this event if it was just in our solar system, but instead its name is AT-5, which does certainly seem to indicate that it is in another solar system somewhere. Well. Not anymore. Not that its star is gone now. So we know that we're in the future, but it's not clear just how far we might be. I don't think that we're very far into the future here. Our submarine is rusted as all get out, and it seems mostly analog controlled too. In fact, this thing seems old by modern standards. So I don't think this thing is new. I think the only real answer here is that the SM-13 has to be some kind of old museum piece pulled out for the job because this crippled society just doesn't have the resources to spare for making something new. That doesn't narrow things down too much, but it at least says that it can't be in the super distant future because something like that would probably be totally fallen into dust by this point if it had been something like millions of years. If I had to guess, I would say it's probably in the ballpark of a few thousand years at best. Look at me, theory crafting before I'm even done explaining things. But yes, basically the plot is that in a not terribly distant future, the quiet rapture occurs where all stars and habitable planets vanish. The only people who survive are people who have been living in ships and space stations. Assumedly, there would also be people living in colonies on uninhabitable worlds too. I don't see why not. Something like a space base on the moon or on Mars should survive such an event, although it doesn't specifically say that in the intro to the game. This leaves the survivors desperate as infrastructure crumbles over the decades. This is one of the first things I think Austin made a mistake in not covering. If it was just habitable planets, it actually wouldn't be so bad. Societies at this tech level would probably have substantial solar-based economies. What do I mean? Building things in space is pretty easy. It's getting to space to begin with, which is the hard part. But by the time you're interstellar like this, you've probably built tons of space stations. In fact, it's almost necessary in order to get to other stars to begin with. Giant solar rays near the sun, Powering big lasers to push solar sails is one of the most realistic ways to reach speeds fast enough to get people to other stars in their lifetime. As we all know, we can't exceed the speed of light due to relativity, and even with methods like this one, you can still probably only get to 20 to 30% the speed of light before you start running into issues where you're hitting interstellar dust so hard that it's hitting you at relativistic speeds and tearing you apart. It would take decades to get to other stars this way, but that's still faster than what we could do now, which can take tens of thousands of years on just chemical engines. And in hard science, we do think that a faster than light engine is totally impossible. All that is to say, many of these space stations will be self-sustaining, just needing solar power to get by. 
Which, yeah, once the sun disappears, these are all doomed. So that's where Austin was right, although he doesn't mention it as a reason. This is another reason why the outer planets of the solar system would suddenly be a lot more attractive to us. And Jupiter and beyond, the amount of light these worlds get is so bad that solar doesn't tend to make much sense as a power source. We would expect a lot of the stuff that we've already built out here, stations, ships, colonies, to already be running on nuclear power. Either actual nuclear reactors or RTGs, like many of the probes that we've sent out this way already. And that's where the original Game Theory video misses something. There will actually be a fair amount of infrastructure already out on these worlds. Not so much Uranus and Neptune, because they are so much farther out that they're not really worth it for us. But we do expect that we'd probably have a lot of infrastructure around Jupiter and Saturn by this point. There's a lot of resources there that we want. One such resource is nitrogen. When Austin gave us a lineup of moons that we could live on, he left out one really incredible option. Titan. Titan is Saturn's biggest moon and the second biggest moon in the solar system behind Ganymede. We actually used to think it was the biggest moon, hence the name Titan. We only didn't know for sure because Titan is the only moon in the solar system with an atmosphere. A really thick, dense atmosphere that made it hard to say where the surface even starts. We only found out for sure when we sent the Cassini orbiter there. And it actually took so long for the probe it dropped to land because the atmosphere was so thick that it was almost out of batteries by the time it reached the surface. Titan would be an incredibly good place for humanity to find a new start. Earth's atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. Titan's atmosphere is 98% nitrogen. For perspective, Venus only has 3.5% and Mars only has 1.8%. That's on top of Venus being incredibly toxic and having 93 times Earth's pressure. Meanwhile, Mars has barely any pressure at all. Titan, meanwhile, sends out a dense but cozy 45% more pressure than Earth. Now, we obviously need oxygen for breathing, not nitrogen, but none of the other planets have breathable oxygen either. But nitrogen isn't toxic to us, as you can guess. You're inhaling large amounts of it on a daily basis mixed with your oxygen. Likewise on Titan, we can mix this with the oxygen that we manufacture. This actually makes things a lot safer as a pure oxygen environment is extremely flammable. We learned this the hard way with the Apollo 1 mission, where three astronauts unfortunately lost their lives in an almost pure oxygen environment. When a part failed and let out a stray spark, the command pod was flooded with fire almost immediately, and they couldn't make it out. More importantly though, nitrogen is a key ingredient in growing crops. Most plants need nitrogen, and that's actually a key ingredient missing in the Jovian system. Nothing there really has nitrogen. It's actually a problem in the entire solar system. The only two places to import it from are Earth and Titan. And Earth's gone. The nitrogen and pressure aren't the only things Titan has in common with Earth, though. It's also the only other place we know of with standing liquids on the surface. It's not water, of course. It's way too cold for that. Actually, out this far in the solar system, most of the surfaces of these moons is actually made of frozen water ice that's so hard it's like rock. No, the liquid on Titan is liquid methane. It rains on Titan. There's lakes on Titan. There's river channels on Titan. Clouds. It has a whole hydrological system like that of Earth's, but it's all methane. I guess that would make it a methanological cycle. Not only would this make Titan feel a lot more like home than anywhere else, but it also means there's vast lakes of fuel just ready and waiting for us to use. Water isn't a problem here either. It's not a problem anywhere in the Jovian or Saturn systems, actually. We don't have to go to Europa and sell this directly just because we know that there's liquid water oceans just underneath the crust. Like I mentioned, all the moons out here are basically made of ice rock. You can mine it and melt it for water. And you can use electrolysis to burn down that water into oxygen for breathing and hydrogen as yet another fuel option. Titan is no exception. Not to mention that we actually think most of these moons have subsurface water oceans, not just Europa and Enceladus. They both just have it closer to the surface. And as you guessed it, we think that Titan probably has one too. So if we absolutely have to get liquid water without melting it, we can do that too. Even better, we actually think that Titan has cryovolcanoes. Austin actually mentions that Triton, Neptune's largest moon, has having these, but Titan probably does too. Just like having a hydro system like Earth's, it could even have a geological system like Earth's. Remember how I said that ice is rock out here? Well, what's liquid rock on Earth? Lava. Liquid rock on Titan? Sludgy water ice. I bring this up because Austin brought up geothermal power as being a possible power source, and that being the ultimate reason why he chose Io as the future location of humanity. He's right that geothermal power will be more effective here. It's real volcanism and not just cryovolcanism. But as we discussed, Titan has plenty of fuel for us to use anyway. We don't need geothermal. Io isn't even the best place in the Jovian system to put humanity anyway. Sulfur dioxide is toxic and the majority of what's coming out of those volcanoes. And the reason it's so active is because it's so close to Jupiter too. 
that close to Jupiter, you're going to be getting pounded by radiation coming from Jupiter's magnetic field. And not to mention, because this moon is active, it's probably racked with earthquakes or Io quakes in this case. Io is probably a good candidate for mining and beaming power from it, but you wouldn't want to live there. The best place to live in the Jovian system is the one that Austin hardly mentions at all, Callisto. Callisto is the furthest of the four main moons from Jupiter. This puts it outside of Jupiter's main radiation belts. It gets very little tidal heating from Jupiter, too, which while it would mean it would be getting less geothermal power opportunities, it's not going to suffer from earthquakes caused by it either, or volcanoes erupting. That would make it a much safer place to live than Io. Which brings us back to Titan. It's also distant enough from Saturn that it's safe from its radiation. Then on top of that, its thick atmosphere protects it from radiation even further, just like Earth's atmosphere helps protect it. The other reason that Titan might be a very good place to settle is because of its low gravity and very thick atmosphere, things like helicopters and drones would be extremely effective out here. This would make building an infrastructure out here a lot easier to do. Although Jupiter has four very large moons and Saturn only has one, Jupiter has no further substantial moons, just two of modest size with a total of 64 moons. Saturn, in comparison, has six substantial moons, not including Titan. Then it has six more of a modest size and 83 total. Not to mention the rings themselves, which are their own treasure trove of easy-to-capture rocks of mostly water ice. Okay, so I just spent way more time than I expected talking about Jupiter versus Saturn. Just the more I looked into it, the more and more appealing Titan became to the point that I think it's hard to say there's anything better out there in our solar system for this scenario. Anyway, let's move on to the drier discussion. It was discussion of the light from Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is a horrible choice to try to calculate solar power received from. It's a red dwarf star, meaning it's very small and very dim. How dim is it? Well, it wasn't discovered until 1915. That might sound like a long time ago to you, over 100 years ago. But do you know when we discovered the second closest star? The one that we used to think was the closest? Alpha Centauri was discovered in 200 AD. That's right, forget 100 years ago, try 1820 years ago. And that's simply when we recorded it. It's visible to the naked eye, so it was known to the ancients. Proxima Centauri, on the other hand, can't even be seen with the naked eye. You see the problem here? Oh wait, you can't, because you can't see it. What makes a lot more sense would be to measure the light coming from the brightest star in the sky. Not to mention anything further away will receive ghost light from longer. Proxima Centauri is the closest star to us, so it'll be the first that we lose light from, not counting the sun. The brightest star in the night sky is Sirius, also known as Alpha Canis Majoris. It's so bright that sometimes it's brighter than Mars and Saturn in the night sky. It's over 8 light years away, so we'd receive light from it for 8 years after the quiet rapture instead of just 4. Here is where I was going to do the math of this equation to compare the two. The problem is you can just Google the luminosity in watts of Proxima Centauri and it just comes up. But when I do the same thing for Sirius, nothing comes up. After that, it becomes a rabbit hole of complicated math problems to try to get that number. And it's a little too much for me to do. I'm running a solo show here, and I work a full-time job. That's disappointing, though, so I thought of a different way to compare them. Apparent magnitude is the brightness of a star as seen from Earth. And before you ask no, it doesn't matter if we measure from Earth, Jupiter, or Saturn. When talking about the distances between stars, that basically becomes irrelevant. Apparent magnitude is a logarithmic scale. A difference of 5 magnitudes means it's 100 times more bright. And that can be calculated with this formula, which is a lot more simple than the one he was giving us. Magnitude is measured backwards of what you might imagine, with negative numbers being more bright. Sirius clocks in at negative 1.47, while Proxima Centauri is way down at 11.05. Plug them into the formula and we get 101.916.8122. That's right. Sirius is 101,917 times brighter than Proxima Centauri. From there, we can take Austin's number and multiply it by 101,917 to get the picowatts per meter squared from Sirius, and we get 1.39 times 10 to the 20th, which you know is better, but yeah, this whole thing is irrelevant. All the stars are so incredibly far away compared to the sun, it doesn't even matter what star we calculate for, even with a full night sky full of them. It's such an unfathomably low amount of solar power from the ghost light of dead stars that it's completely useless. The only good starlight we'll have is being able to tell the difference between the ground and sky when you look at the horizon. You gotta remember what I said earlier. Even with the sun still existing, solar power at Jupiter and beyond? Pretty bad. NASA prefers to use RTGs out here. And the only probe we've sent out here with solar panels is the Juno mission, 
which has three giant solar panels and still only has about 300 watts of power from all of that. For comparison, just recording this video right here and not really doing anything else on my computer, my computer's drawing 300 watts. And that takes us to the end of our video. Ultimately, in the very long term, it really wouldn't matter what planet or moon system humanity chose to go with. Jupiter or Saturn, both systems would eventually run out of resources. Without a solar economy, it would become really difficult to get out to other planets that are out there. The only real thing that could save humanity is figuring out fusion power. With fusion power, you could start skimming the vast supplies of hydrogen and the gas giants and fuse it together for immense power, safely and cleanly. After all, fusion is like having the power of the sun in the palm of your hand. And suddenly not having real stars wouldn't be so bad. It also lets you build engines that are so powerful they can get you moving as fast as the solar-powered laser highways could have in the past. I hope you all know this wasn't made to throw shade at Austin or game theory, but just to help expand your knowledge on the subject beyond what they covered. But hey, that's just a theory. Ugh. Oh wait, wrong channel. I hope you all enjoyed the video. And if you did, remember to hit the like button. Keep the conversation going in the comments and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Until next time, have a great day.